Before we begin, I've got a special promo from our friends at Chilling. Chilling has evolved, and now in addition to thousands of horror stories, Chilling also has podcasts, short horror films, full-length feature films, shows, and more content that will be added every month. They've allowed me to share the following trailer with you for their new feature film, Gale, Stay Away from Oz, streaming right now only on Chilling for subscribers. And luckily, you can get 50% off an annual Chilling subscription via the Chilling website with code GALE2023. Link in the description. Just relax. Listen to the sounds. The tempo. And just picture yourself there. In your dream. Can you see it? Are you there? Yes. Yes. Gail. You're Emily Gail. Yes. And you say you're a relation of Dorothy's? I don't know. Maybe. What you have there is a handwritten early draft of Dorothy's first book. Her writings were all based on her dreams of a place. Us? I feel this is the best chance we have to unlocking all of this. To finding the truth. The truth? Yes, about Dorothy, the slippers. Stay away from us! Stay away from us! Stay Your dreams, they're the key to all of this. Am I? Let's start at the beginning, and then you can learn for yourself. Tales from the Break Room is a viewer submission podcast, so send me your scariest work stories at eeriecast.com slash submit, and leave us a rating on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Thank you. Welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? If someone nicknamed me Mr. Nasty after I died, I'd be so upset. I would haunt everyone's morning coffee to make it taste like a stick of deodorant. Welcome back, my friends. Today I've actually got such a story of one such angry spirit named Mr. Nasty, and also a very disturbing tale of one of the most horrific things found on a farm. Enjoy. These are tales from the break room. The Husband's Horse from K.L. This is my husband's story. He is a professional farrier, or a horse shoer, for those of you that aren't around horses much. Now, being a farrier, he's been to the entire spectrum of different locations to take care of clients' horses. Some took him to beautiful places that you would picture in a magazine. Others have been extremely run down, barely standing sheds. When he gets called from new clients, he's usually able to look them up on Facebook first to get an idea of what he's going to be dealing with. But some of the older generations that contact him just have a landline, so he's got to go in blind. This is one of those stories. It will be told from his perspective. My job has a lot of factors that can either make my day truly enjoyable or make it the longest gut-wrenching experience. Since I mostly work outside, the weather greatly affects my job. When it's hot out, I deal with clingy flies and heat exhaustion. 
When it's cold, I deal with grumpy clients having to stand in the cold, holding their horse, while I work on its feet. If the horse doesn't stand well, that makes my job all the more challenging. But the absolute worst part of my job is having to deal with people on a daily basis. Most are completely normal, but I've also had my fair share of the not-so-normal horse owners. This story by far is the most unnerving and creepiest scenario I've ever dealt with, and it definitely shows the dark side of poor mental health. This took place during the winter in Colorado. I received a call from an elderly woman late one evening. She asked if I could come take a look at her horse that wasn't getting any better after having a few other farriers come out to work on him. I asked her where she was located, and she gave me an address. It worked out that she was in an area I was going to be close to in a few days. I cover a three-hour radius from my home, and she was about an hour and a half away. I told her I could work her in at the end of the day on my way home, and then I asked if she had a barn we could work in, since it would be dark by the time I'd get there. She told me she had a very nice large barn that had electricity and a large heater in it. I thought, Great, this one will be a piece of cake. We agreed on the date and approximate time, and she gave me step-by-step -step directions to get to her place, as the closest small town was about 20 miles away. In other words, she was in the middle of nowhere, but that wasn't anything unusual for me. The day came and I finished up my previous appointments, and I started heading in the direction of her place on my way home. It was snowing hard by that point, and I was really looking forward to that nice warm barn that she said she had. I pulled off the interstate, and I started going down country roads. I was keeping an eye on my odometer to make sure I didn't miss any turns, as I had no cell phone reception. Before long, I finally saw a sign that read farmhouse with an arrow, indicating the last turn that she had instructed me to make. About a mile and a half later, I came to a ranch at the end of a dead-end road, I thought, no, this couldn't be the right place. There was a little farmhouse and a big barn, but everything was completely dilapidated, run down. It looked like it had been abandoned for years. I sat there rereading the directions she gave me, thinking, well, crap, am I really going to have to drive 20 miles back to town to get reception just to give this woman a call? That's when I saw this tiny little hunched-over old woman walking through the snow in a nightgown, winter coat, and work boots. She carried what looked to be a lantern. What in the world? I thought. I climbed out of my truck and approached her. She happily greeted me, asking if I had any trouble finding the place. I followed her as she led me to the entrance of her barn. We talked for a couple of minutes as she explained again what she and her husband thought was wrong with the horse. I listened to her, suggesting a couple of options. She interrupted me at that point, asking that I address her husband when speaking. I was taken aback. I looked around, thinking maybe her husband had come up behind me, and I didn't hear him because of the blowing snow. But there was no one else there. I looked at the woman and said, Um, your husband? She replied, Yes, please don't ignore him. My stomach dropped. What the heck did I walk into, I thought. Now, I've dealt with some people that are pretty far out there. She didn't seem to pose a threat. And honestly, at this point, she wasn't the craziest person I've dealt with. I apologized to her and played along. She told me it was fine and began to lead me towards one of the stalls in the barn. Finally getting a better look at her barn... I came to the realization that not only was there no electricity, but the big heater was actually an antique wood-burning stove, buried under four inches of dirt and dust. She motioned me over to the stall she was standing closest to. I walked over to the stall door. I could see there was a horse on the ground towards the back of the stall, in the shadows, but the light from her lantern didn't penetrate the darkness enough to see clearly. I pulled my phone out, turning on the flashlight, and I started to shine it inside the stall. My heart stopped. 
blood running cold. My flashlight had landed on a horse in the stall, but that horse was dead. And it had been dead for a long, long while. It was past the point of smelling bad. All that was left was basically hide and bones in the shape of a horse. It was still wearing a halter, and sat in front of this long dead horse was fresh hay and a full bucket of clean water. By then I was doing my best not to soil myself. Was this a setup? I thought. Was someone going to jump out from one of the other stalls and try to kill me? My mind raced with every horrifying answer that popped into my head. I looked back at the old lady. My breath caught in my throat as I looked around, searching for anyone else that could be there. She stood there, calmly holding her lantern, looking at me. Then she asked, What do you think we can do for him? I was stupefied. I looked at her, then back at the horse, as she waited patiently for an answer. I about jumped out of my skin when I heard movement further back in the barn. I shone my light towards the noise, and I saw eyes shine from two other horses. I walked closer to them, discovering two very old horses that were extremely emaciated, hooves so long they were curling up like elf shoes. This was extreme neglect. These horses were starving to death, knocking on death's door at that very moment, and this lady was giving a horse that had been expired for who knows how long, clean water and fresh hay. I couldn't wrap my head around it. Every cell in my body was screaming for me to get the heck out of there. I turned back to the old lady, asking if she was talking about these horses. She grew irritated and snapped at me. No, I'm wanting to know what we can do to help my husband's horse right here, swinging the lantern towards the dead one. My mind was blown. I had no idea what the heck was going on, but I felt like I needed to tread lightly with this woman. After all, we were out in the middle of nowhere during a large snowstorm, and I had zero cell reception. She seemed like a frail, little old lady, but who knew if there was a shotgun stashed somewhere close by or if anyone else was hiding there? In my experience, and having relatives that lived far off the beaten path, those were the people you didn't mess with. I stood silent, trying to hide the panic I was feeling. Finally, I blurted out a routine answer for a client of a horse that needed corrective work. <clears throat> so, uh, what I'm gonna need you to do is call a vet and, uh, get me some x-rays on this horse. I want to see what's going on inside his foot before we do any sort of corrective work. Once you get those x-rays, I'll have the vet email me the images. Then I'll head back out here and get them fixed up. She looked to her left and asked, Does that sound good? I'm assuming she was asking her husband... She waited a couple of seconds, then said to me, smiling, Yes, yes, we think that is a good plan. Thank you. I will get a hold of our vet first thing in the morning. How much do I owe you for coming out? I was already starting to walk towards my truck to get the heck out of Dodge. I yelled back over my shoulder, uh, No charge. I'll be in touch with you after I hear back from the vet. Then we'll schedule another visit. I started my rig and threw it into drive. I hauled tail out of there, trying to remember the way back to the interstate. I kept replaying the whole interaction in my head. Did all that really just happen? As soon as I had reception, I put in a call to the county sheriff and I started to explain the situation to him. He asked if it was Mrs. A on County Road X, like he wasn't even surprised at all. I was floored. Uh, yeah, yes sir, that's her, I told him. Do you think she needs a welfare check? He explained I was the third farrier to call about her, but apparently I was the first to tell anyone about the two emaciated horses that she had in the back of her barn. 
Apparently, I had stayed much longer than the others who had been called out there. He told me point blank that he would not send anyone out to her place as he already had multiple times in the past. I was getting the vibe that it would be difficult to find anyone willing to go out there and deal with her. I was frustrated, persistent that I was concerned about her and those horses. I told him that she was talking to her husband who was clearly not there, that I thought she needed help. Those two other horses would surely die if nobody stepped in. He stopped me, took a deep breath, and explained that years earlier, before he was the sheriff, her husband had disappeared and was assumed dead, although his body was never found. It was speculated by neighbors and people in town that she had something to do with it. After his disappearance, she went off the deep end and never really got over it. This little old lady lived out there alone in the middle of nowhere, talking to her dead husband, taking care of his dead horse. I never did hear from her again. I have no idea if a vet ever did go out there to x-ray her dead horse. I did make a call to the local humane society, trying to get those two living horses some help. I never heard anything back from that either. It's been four years since this happened, and I still think of her every time I'm close to that exit on the interstate. Part of me wants to go see if she's still alive, but every time I consider it, I get full body goosebumps remembering that whole bizarre encounter. I hope she somehow was able to get the help she clearly needed. That entire scenario is truly heartbreaking. Workplace Hauntings from Mr. Savage What I'm about to say is 100% true, with multiple witnesses, save for only a single part, where I was alone on the job for a short time. I'm a 6'4", 240-ish pound guy. I'm 28 years old, and both of these stories took place about two years back, so I would have been around 26 at the time. My other two co-workers were 27 and 22. I'm one of those big guys who take no type of crap from any kind of people. The type of guy to be 20 miles out from civilization, possibly hear a window go in the bushes, and be fully ready to roll out of my sleeping bag half naked with a fillet knife and a small caliber pistol. I guess I'd be the first to die in your Hollywood horror flick. No, I'm not stupid, but nothing really scares me. And I'd like to think that when I'm in the woods, I'm the scariest thing out there. For a living, I install windows and siding. I started working in this profession when I was 16. Sure, I've seen some creepy houses. I've also seen some downright nightmarishly disgusting houses. But these two events truly scared the crap out of me, to the point I refused to return to either property for any amount of money. Some houses I've been in have given me bad vibes, but nothing like these two structures. Now that you understand pretty much the gist of my backstory, I'll begin with the shorter of the two tales. The Dungeon Both my boss Steve and co-worker Rob, 52 and 27 respectively, were witness to this. It was late fall in 2019. We live in eastern Georgia, and do a lot of work around the central Savannah River, which includes parts of western South Carolina. This particular job was almost two hours away, in a tiny dot-on-the-map South Carolina town that, for the life of me, I can't remember the name of. I think it may have been something along the lines of Spring Hill. We were instructed that we'd be putting windows into a church. This was meant to be a quick and easy wood tear-out, replacing eight windows, a simple half a day then chill out on the couch kind of gig. We ended up on the road where the job was located, but the GPS on my boss's phone was losing signal. So when we saw this big church at the bottom of the hill with a sprawling graveyard, we figured we'd found the place. I was excited to knock out a few windows on a modern construction building and get back down the road. But as you probably guessed by now, it was the wrong building. Unsettlingly enough, the graveyard there was infested with a huge murder of vultures. 
I mean, they were all in the trees, sitting all over the gravestones. Must have been hundreds of them. My boss jokingly told me to go check them out to see what they were invested in out there. But I quickly declined, as the area had been subjected to intense lowland flooding, and I could still hear the swollen creek in the distant tree line. I definitely wasn't going to ruin my Friday morning by potentially seeing a washed-out grave with vultures doing their thing. It turned out that the church we were supposed to be at was atop the hill overlooking the previous church and that gruesome graveyard setting. It was housed in a post-Civil War African-American school and community center that had a historical plaque and all that. So the windows happened to be in this ancient basement of this ancient community center turned church. There were four single frames downstairs and two double frames upstairs. The downstairs windows were all boarded up with plywood and there wasn't a single light to be used anywhere in the basement. My coworker Rob a guy about six foot two and 120 pounds soaking wet, flat out refused to go in there. He said it was too much like a dungeon for him. So like the big tough guy I try to be, I strapped on my tool belt and charged into the darkness with only a four foot crowbar and my cell phone in hand for light. I instantly felt a heavy oppression, but I chalked it up to the environment I entered. Being a main room with a low ceiling with a conjoining long dark corridor, everything was rough cut stone and big exposed iron pipes. It really did have a dungeon-like feel. There were two rooms at the end of the corridor. Both had windows that needed to be replaced and a creepy stone staircase leading up. Long story short, we got all the windows swapped in the creepy basement and I headed upstairs to what I expected to be a much nicer feeling main church. Only, I was dead wrong. The oppression I felt in the dungeon-like basement was like a sunny day on the beach with an ice-cold mojito in my hand and a pretty girl in my lap compared to what I felt upon entering the stone-silent sanctuary of the church. The air was ice-cold, and I don't mean from the air conditioning. I could nearly see my breath as I made my way to the back room of the church, where the two pairs of windows were located. The entire time I worked in that upper portion of the church, it felt hard to breathe, as if there really was something there, squeezing my lungs, standing over me just radiating hatred onto me. Rob said he could feel it too, but it wasn't quite as intense as he never actually entered the building. After we finished and loaded our trailer and we were ready to pull off the property, Rob tapped me on the shoulder and said, Dude, look over there. I looked over at where he was pointing. There was a padlock on a door we hadn't even opened or touched at all, rocking wildly back and forth. I looked around and noticed there was no wind, no sounds, just the diesel engine of the truck idling some 30 or so feet away. Although the sun was out, it was like the entire area was a few shades darker than normal and the hair on the back of my neck was standing up. So, like the foolishly brave idiot I am, I walked up to the aforementioned padlock, put my finger against the bottom of it, causing it to stop moving, and I ensured that it was fully motionless. There was still no wind, nothing that could possibly make that lock move in any way. It was stone still as I turned and took two steps away from it. Rob's face was ghost white, as he raised his finger and pointed. Look at it, he said. I didn't need to turn around, because I could hear the lock swinging back and forth behind me in such a way that it was like someone had slapped me into motion. I slowly turned around as the blood in my veins transitioned to the icy sensation that can only occur when you know something cannot be explained. I had to force myself to calmly walk away as every instinct in my body screamed at me to run. My instincts are less fight or flight and more stubborn fight, but that day you could have called me a 747 as I calmly wigged the heck out and retreated. I know for a fact that nothing aside from a supernatural force could possibly have caused that lock to move. All the rest overlooked. That one instance was my paranormal nope-the-heck-out moment. 
So now that you have my first major ghost on the job situation, I have one that's a bit more scary for me, as I believe I could have been killed if my little ninja senses hadn't kicked in and made me look up at the right time. That little sixth sense of mine has saved me a few times in the past, from getting hit by a car, getting squashed under a falling houseboat, kept me from getting snake bit several times too. Not sure how it works, but I'm thankful for it. This one is called The House in the Middle of Nowhere. This series of events starts in the area surrounding my hometown. At the time, my boss was laid out with a broken foot. He's diabetic, so it got bad and nearly cost him his foot. In essence, he was laid out of work and just kept enough jobs around so I could work and make money. Rob had gotten himself fired for some reason or another, and although he is back with us now, he wasn't present for this period of time. Instead, I had another guy, a young buck named Eric. He was 22 at the time and fresh out of prison. This guy was all serious and institutionalized. He was about 5 foot 10, around 160 pounds. Not bulky and muscled, but no weakling either. We arrived on the job. It was summer of 2020. We had about 20 or so wood removal windows. This means the sashes are made of wood, and we had to put siding in the gables and install freeze board capping, vinyl soffit, and fascia capping, as the majority of the house was brick. Easy good running house with minimal rotting wood. Simple enough. We started on the windows. Upstairs was a breeze and we got to the downstairs portion. In the godforsaken basement. Nobody lived in this house as it was under full renovation. It was out in the middle of nowhere in a rural area attached to my hometown of Thompson, Georgia, known as Messina. It's home to several historical sites as well as the infamously haunted rock house, which was just down the road less than two or three miles from this job site. Upon entering the basement, it was like the air was full of this dank static, not super oppressive, but there was something not exactly right. I ignored it and installed the windows. The following morning, we arrived on the job, and Eric tapped my shoulder, saying, Look, there's someone in that window. Sure enough, there was a pale face staring out the window as we pulled in. I directed him to cover the back of the house as I would enter through the front, being there were only three doors, one in the garage, one in the basement, and the front door. I knew that the bay door for the garage was chained and padlocked from the inside and couldn't be opened without a key. So I entered the front door, 40 caliber pistol in hand. I swept the top floor of the house, thinking that the intruder might be a thief stealing tools or a homeless potentially drugged up squatter looking to shelter in a house. But the first was more likely. After sweeping the upper level of the house and finding it empty, I grudgingly started down the steps to the basement. Midway down the staircase, I felt a push and a weightlessness as I tumbled down the final five or six stairs and thankfully, the chamber of my pistol was empty because during that tumble, I ended up with the barrel under my chin and I accidentally pulled the trigger. Hearing the click of the firing pin over an empty chamber still gives me chills to this day. I hadn't forgotten to rack around. I normally carry with one in the chamber but as it turns out, my brother had used my pistol the day before and had not racked one into the chamber, and potentially, through his laziness, saved my life. Hearing me holler as I fell, Eric came into the house and down the stairs. In the fall, I injured my shoulder, and I was sitting there scared crapless, trying to regain my composure as I came to terms with narrowly escaping blowing my head off by accident. We finished searching the basement and found no one. All the doors and windows were locked and secured, so we blew it off as just seeing some odd reflection in the early dawn light. I chalked the being pushed down the stairs sensation into a scenario where I was just nervous and in a rush. Perhaps I simply tripped and fell down the stairs and my mind fabricated the entire thing to fill in the blinks. Yeah, I know, I was being stupid brushing things off way too easily. The rest of the week went by smoothly. I often felt watched or uneasy while on the property, but all in all, it was all right. On the final day, it happened to be a Friday. 
Everything went well and we finished loading all the trash and equipment about three hours before dark. We had two trailers, one for ladders, walkboards, and equipment, and the other is to haul materials to the job and trash away from the job. So affectionately, we called them ladder trailer and trash trailer. We hooked up to the ladder trailer and drove to my boss's house. We collected our pay and I took Eric home before stopping off and getting a few things from the store before heading back to the job alone to collect the trash trailer. I had elected to go solo as I could handle hooking up the trailer by myself. No big deal. The trailer was parked on a slight grade and I backed the ball under the hitch and connected it. It's important to note that I mention it being on a grade as I could not have left the truck in gear. I know for a fact that it was in park with the parking brake set. After hooking the safety chains, lights, and ensuring the hitch was secure, I moved to the wheel chocks and checked the back of the trailer. The top of this trailer has four individual gates that serve as a ceiling that opens, as well as the back of it having two top doors and a full-length bottom door. It's a cage-type trailer that has expanded steel mesh's walls. The back doors have a chain that goes up and loops through the handles of the two rear ceiling panels to hold them closed. I noticed that the chain was not fastened, so I reached up to fix the issue. My ninja senses barked off at me as I noticed the trailer moving closer to me, and I heard the truck engine redline as it revved up. I barely moved out of the way as it shot back and collided with a large pine tree about 10 feet behind where it had been. I found the gear position in reverse when I got to the cab of my dually. I put it in park, turned the ignition off, and put the key in my pocket as I went back to the trailer fixing the chain. Then I hauled tail out of that place, vowing that I would never leave a truck running while connecting or going over a trailer again. That place was truly haunted. Nothing anyone says can change my mind. I nearly died twice on the same property, and I refuse to ever go back. These are my two 100% true job site hauntings, as best I can remember them. I started writing these stories sober, but ended up killing a fifth of wine trying to cope with the memories of my supernatural encounters at work. Some of this still gives me nightmares, and it's honestly hard to talk about. But I assure you beyond a doubt, these events did occur. Mr. Nasty From Your Friendly Neighborhood Witch During the summer of 2021, I was offered a job working in a local shop in my town in the southeast of the UK. The job was already a little odd, as it would be at a witchcraft and spirituality shop, selling things like incense, crystals, and spell packets. I'd been a practicing pagan for a few years. However, I'd frequented this particular shop since it had opened earlier that year. Due to this, I wasn't too thrown when the owner let me know that there were a couple of ghosts known to frequent the building. Though, part of me did think she perhaps was encouraging the rumor as it would add a certain appeal for the types of customers that would frequent the shop. In particular, I was told there were two ghosts. Alfred, who lived upstairs and had a bad habit of hiding things if you didn't greet him in the mornings. And Elizabeth, who enjoyed knocking things off shelves. Apparently, a psychic had visited the shop a few times prior to my employment there and had heard the names of Alfred and Elizabeth. This psychic also warned the owner of a negative presence in the basement as well, but I can't confirm that myself. I never really had reason to go down to the basement, nor did anyone else, as it had a lot of issues with flooding and dampness, which meant we couldn't use it for storage or as a staff room. So the idea of a ghost down there never really bothered me. I did have a few experiences of seeing shadows out of the corners of my eye, seeing things knocked off shelves despite no one being in the shop other than myself. And a couple of times I saw the back door, which led to a tiny enclosed courtyard, open and shut, followed by the basement door opening and shutting too but that was about it. Nothing terribly spooky, and if I saw anything, I would just kindly ask aloud for some peace and quiet. Then I wouldn't see anything else for a while. Overall, I really loved my job. 
I often stayed for hours after closing time, sitting in the back room, using the workbench to work on whatever craft project I was set on at the time. Until one night in early September, when everything changed for me. It was about 8 or 9 p.m. It was getting quite dark outside, so I decided to wrap up my project and set about doing the final closing tasks that I always left until the end of the night. Namely, hoovering the floors, getting the sign in from the road, locking all the doors, and turning off all the lights. As I walked back and forth, I started to feel uneasy, like I was being watched. I started to get really panicked that maybe someone was watching me from outside the shop. There were a lot of big windows there. But every time I walked past the door leading to the basement, it would get worse. I would feel colder, more anxious, and then the footsteps started. It sounded like there was someone behind me, walking half a step behind. The wrong floorboards would creak as I walked. They were slightly out of time with mine, and they sounded heavy, like big clumpy boots, whereas I was in thin trainers. I stopped in front of the till, terrified to turn around. And as I stood there, I started to feel the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. And I could feel someone's breath on the back of my neck too. With that, I bolted. I already had my keys in hand, so I ran to the front door. And as I pulled it open, I heard the basement door swing open and a booming laugh coming from the basement. I slammed that front door shut, locking it, running home. I was so scared, I didn't even bother turning on the nightlights or setting the alarm for the night. I spoke to my boss the following day. She said it must have been Mr. Nasty. Apparently, Mr. Nasty is what she called the presence in the basement. She had had a few bad experiences with it before, but never anything quite like this. I'm glad she believed me and didn't reprimand me for not finishing my duties. I haven't experienced anything quite like that since, though I've still worked at the same shop over holidays and work there now, since I'm in between jobs after graduating from university. Things still fly off shelves, weird noises still come from the basement, and I still see shadows out of the corner of my eye, but hopefully that is the last I'll see of Mr. Nasty. Two stories from Boink W98. Room 232. The following happened during my time stationed in California when I was enlisted in the military. In the military, most of us lower ranking members live in barracks rooms. It's basically structured like a motel. Each building has about 100 or so rooms. Now, I don't know about everyone's barracks on base but mine had so many of us assigned to it that we all had roommates, two people per room. The roommate I had was a newer guy, a rank below me, but we became pretty good friends, and years later, even to this day, we keep in touch. He was lucky enough to be stationed in California, which just so happens to be his home state. This meant that on weekends, he could go home or easily visit his family and friends. Unlike me, I'm from Maryland, and I had to spend money on plane tickets whenever I went home. Almost every Friday, when he got out of work, he would pack a bag and leave until Sunday night. It was nice to have the room to myself during that time, although my roommate and I worked different schedules, so I had to work on certain weekends. Now, the barracks buildings are very old, so people are always telling ghost stories. Whether they were true or not, I have no idea. I never really believed in anything paranormal like that anyway, so to me the stories were just entertainment. One Saturday morning, I woke up to an empty room like usual. I woke up earlier than my alarm was set for. I went to quickly use the bathroom, and I came straight back to bed so I could fall back to sleep before having to get ready for work. That weekend was one of those weekends where, like I said before, I would have to work. When I lay back in the bed, I slept on my side that faced the wall. 
moments before falling asleep, I felt what seemed like a hand grabbing a hold of my head. I quickly turned around and I didn't see anything. I was still alone in the room. Still, I stood up and looked around. I even called out my roommate's name, even though I knew he shouldn't be there. I was just hoping that, for some reason, he came back earlier than expected. But I found and heard nothing. It remained silent and empty in the room. Of course, I couldn't go back to sleep after that, so I decided to just get ready for work. That whole morning, I couldn't help but feel as if I wasn't alone in the room. I couldn't stop thinking about what happened. I went to work, and when I got off, I felt uneasy going into my room again. Later that day, I was going to have a girl over, since my roommate was gone. I went in and got changed out of my work clothes, and got ready to go pick her up to bring her back to the base. When the two of us got back to my room... I felt a little more at ease having someone in there with me. Eventually, we decided on something to eat, and we left. As soon as we got to the car, she said she'd forgot her phone on the bed, so I gave her my room key, and I told her I'll pull the car up while she gets her phone. When she came back to the car, I remember her saying clear as day, I didn't know you had a roommate. This girl had never met my roommate before, and I didn't know what she was talking about, since, as you know, my roommate was gone. I looked at her and said, What do you mean? She said that when she went back into the room, there was a man sitting on the other bed. She said he didn't say anything, but he did look at her when she went into the room. My heart sank. I immediately ran back to the room, finding nothing. There was no one there. I texted my roommate to be sure, and he did assure me he was not on the base and he'd been home since Friday afternoon. I left the room to go back outside, not sure what to say to my date about what happened. So I just kept to myself. She ended up sleeping in the room with me that night once we got back from dinner. When I woke up for work the next Sunday morning, everything seemed normal. I got changed for work and she got ready to leave. The two of us left together, and when we got to my car, she told me, That's so weird. Once again, I asked what she was talking about. She explained, I guess your roommate came back to the room once we left. She then pointed at the window of my barracks room. There I saw a man, standing in my room, staring out the window blankly. He was wearing his uniform and was emotionless. That sent shivers down my spine. I drove her off the base back to her place, deciding that after work that day I would wait until my roommate got back to actually go back into the room. When he came back, I told him what happened. We spoke to the barracks manager, and we were able to move rooms after lying, saying the toilet or something was broken. I don't remember what it was exactly. But I know I'll never forget what happened in my original barracks, room 232. House Cleaning For a time, I worked at an independent house cleaning company. We would often be hired by millionaires, people like that who own big mansions that are just too big for them to want to clean themselves. One day, we got a call from some business owner that wanted his house cleaned after a party. Since we usually clean bigger houses, we would ask for a few hours in the house to clean, varying with the house size. The customer asked if we would be willing to work overnight due to the sheer size of the place. And it was huge. I don't remember the exact square footage, but it was basically bigger than any house I've ever lived in, bigger than all of them combined, too. My manager agreed, and assigned three of us to work the house. He decided to pay us overtime for working overnight. The three of us, Rebecca, Stephanie, and I, all showed up at this house at the assigned time of 9pm. We knocked and the owner let us in. The guy was a tall man, wearing a suit, and he had slicked over hair. He stood up straight and was very welcoming. He told us he would be out all night, 
Then he'd be back in the morning. He thanked us for working overnight, and he headed out, leaving the three of us to get to work. We decided to split up and work an hour each, then meet back in the living room for a 15-minute break. I started in the kitchen, which was on the ground floor. Rebecca went upstairs, and Stephanie started in the basement. The kitchen was huge and had a large island in the center. Party plates and red solo cups were all over the countertops and spilled onto the floor. I began with a trash bag, picking up all the loose trash. Once I finished with that, I decided I needed to start with the dishes in the sink. The sink, however, contained mainly knives, all dirty with dark dried stains that were nearly impossible to get off. I must have spent most of my hour scrubbing them. That was it for the sink. I placed everything in the dishwasher to dry, but I noticed it was full, full of even more large knives. At the moment, this just seemed weird, having so many knives and all of them being dirty at the same time, but I didn't really think much more of it. I found the correct drawers later and placed them in there. The hour flew by and before I knew it, I heard Rebecca and Stephanie calling me from the living room, wondering where I was. I quickly came over, and we all agreed this was going to take just as long to clean as we thought. After a moment of silence, Stephanie asked if any of us had seen anything unusual when we were cleaning. I asked what she meant. She told us that while she was cleaning the basement, she could not help but notice the stains on the carpet. She told us they were dark in color and were impossible to remove. The stains even went up onto the wall, and when she began to wipe them, she saw the water she used to clean turn red. Rebecca shrugged it off, saying it must have been some sort of crazy party. I could tell that Stephanie was clearly bothered, and I told her about knives I found in the sink. The combination of dark red stains in the basement and dark red stains on the knives did not sit well in our minds. Rebecca merely brushed this off, telling us the 15 minutes was up and it was time to get back to work. The house was huge, after all, so we couldn't waste too much time. So the cycle reset. Another hour of work, and we'd all meet back for a break after that. I went back to finish the kitchen and moved on to the office room. The office was generally very clean. I emptied the trash can and began organizing some loose papers on his desk. It was when I walked behind his desk when I realized the floor sounded different. I stomped my foot lightly on the floor once again, and the same thing. It sounded like the floor was sort of hollow. Once again, I brushed it off, but over time, my curiosity was getting the best of me. So eventually I decided to lift the rug covering the floorboards. There I found a notch in the wood that acted as a handle. I pulled on it, and what I saw inside was clothing men's and women's clothes neatly folded. There was also some jewelry, nothing that was really alarming to me, but I couldn't help but wonder why these clothes were hidden in the floor like that. Just as I closed the floorboard, I heard Rebecca scream from upstairs. Stephanie and I quickly ran up to where we heard her. We found her on the floor, panting, staring at a now closed door. We were able to calm her down and she told us what happened. While she was cleaning, the owner of the house came out from behind her and tried to strangle her. She said she was able to get away, and he chased her out of the room, closing the door behind her. I didn't know what to think. That was such a sudden and bizarre story. But Stephanie, who was already irritated with Rebecca due to her brushing off her uncomfortable feelings in the basement, grew irritated with Rebecca's claims. She walked right into the room she'd come from, she found nothing. Rebecca stood up and quit on the spot. She walked right out of the front door, and we assumed she called for an Uber to pick her up. Stephanie and I decided to work together from there on out, going from room to room to clean the rest of the house. Time passed and nothing out of the ordinary happened. We were making good progress too. We finished the upstairs rooms. When we headed back down the stairs, we noticed the front door had been left open. Thinking Rebecca had just left it open on the way out, we closed the door and continued to clean. A few moments later, we heard what sounded like a knock. 
When we turned around, we saw him, the owner of the house. He smiled and looked at us. He said not to let him interrupt us. It was awkward, having him watch us clean like that, not taking his eyes off of us for even a second. The whole time he had his hand behind his back. It was when I looked up again, I saw that he was now holding something. A knife. A large knife that he had been hiding behind his back. He noticed I saw it and told us, Well, looks like you'd better run. I grabbed Stephanie by her arm, immediately trying to make our way out of the room, away from him. We couldn't leave the house at the moment because he was standing in the way of the front door. So we instead went into a hallway closet and closed it as quietly as we could. We heard him slowly making his way towards us. He scraped the knife on the wall as he walked. He called out, Where are you? Over and over again. We held our breaths as he just walked up to the closet door. I could see his shadow underneath the door. Stephanie held her hand over her mouth, trying to keep herself from crying. The man was just standing there now, not making any noise. His shadow eventually walked away. Quietly, I lay myself on the floor. I peered under the door, and my heart nearly stopped. He had never left. Instead, he'd lain on the floor too, peering underneath the door, now staring right at me. When we locked eyes, I let out a scream, and he quickly stood up. But just before he was able to grab the door, I kicked it open, hitting him hard in his head, making him fall down, dazed. Stephanie and I quickly gathered ourselves and ran to and out the front door into the car. When we started the car, we saw him standing in the front door. Instead of chasing us, he was simply waving. We drove off, quickly calling the police. From what we were able to find out, they never charged him with a thing, stating that was due to a lack of evidence. He still lives in the same spot. I don't know what he would have done with us if we weren't able to run away from him that night, but based off what we cleaned in his house, I don't think we would still be alive today. For the rest of my time working there, Stephanie and I agreed to never work the night shift again. Overnight Shift Nightmare From Israel P.O. I never would have thought working at a gas station would cause me such trauma. It was a simple job, at a time in my life where I just needed a job. It was nothing special. I cashed customers out for gas, lotto tickets, various junk food items, etc. I would stock the store with various items, and I would do some light cleaning of the store during downtime. Typical tasks for a typical cashier job. I worked various different shifts, sometimes days, sometimes mids, sometimes nights. Then of course, overnights. The year was 2014, Orlando, Florida. I was working an overnight shift 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. At around 2 a.m., I decided to take a little restroom break while the store was dead. During an overnight shift, both front doors were to be locked if you had to run to the back to the restroom. The doors would then be unlocked once you returned from your restroom break. The front doors of the place were complete junk. One of the front doors was broken, so you couldn't even lock it completely. Management, of course, told us they put a call in to have it repaired soon. Therefore, I couldn't lock the doors prior to going to the restroom. I thought, what the heck, it was a completely dead night in here, and there probably wouldn't be a customer while I was away. No worries, right? As I was in the restroom, I began to hear someone enter the women's room, which was right next to the men's restroom, where I was. A few minutes later, I hear the knob to my restroom door rattling and shaking. Someone was trying to frantically open my restroom door. Usually, I wouldn't think much of someone trying to hurry me in the restroom. This happened all the time with customers. But for some odd reason, something just didn't feel right about this. I had a bad feeling in the pit of my stomach that if I opened that bathroom door to leave, something bad would be on the other side. Going against my gut feeling, I exited the restroom. 
I couldn't just stay locked in there forever. What if a customer just wanted some help, I thought. Oh, was I completely wrong. Upon leaving the restroom, I was met with two masked men, and I immediately found that they both had guns. All I wanted to do was bolt across the store, out the front door, but I held back my panic and fear and followed their every direction. They directed me back to the front of the store towards the counter. Guns were pointed up against my back. I could feel their barrels right up against my spine. They began to pat me down for valuables, which I didn't have on me. Then they started to yell out various questions. They wanted to know where the safe was. I told them it was in the manager's office, but I had no access to it. If only they knew, as a night safety precaution, our managers would empty out the safe in their office. So there really was no significant amount of money to take at night. Then they wanted the other safe, which was located where I was at now, the front counter. Now there was some money in this safe, but the safe itself was time sensitive. To actually open this safe, and took a whole 10 minutes once the key was entered into the lock. Change would then be dispersed in five minute intervals. I stayed as calm as I could while explaining this to them. All I honestly wanted to do was throw up right there and right then. They must have realized they would be wasting a lot of time waiting on this safe to open and dispense money. I could see they were beginning to panic. One of them then practically ripped open the register drawer and grabbed it. The other started taking cigarettes and whatever else he could get his hands on. They never did take their eyes off of me, nor their guns. Once they got everything they wanted, they ran out the front doors and hopped into a red Honda Civic. It's little details like that that I will never forget. My hands trembling and sweat dripping down my face, I immediately dialed the police. Minutes later, I was being questioned by officers. I went through the entire terrifying situation to them, detail by detail. It wasn't too long after this event, when I was catching up with a friend of mine who happened to work at the gas station not too far from the one I worked at, and he told me he was robbed that very same night. He told me the time of his experience, and it was right after my store had been robbed. Those two men robbed a total of 13 stores in a matter of a week. What got these idiots caught was during one of these robberies, one of them made the fatal mistake of mentioning the other by name. A witness told this to police, and they were soon both tracked down and arrested. Thinking back at this nightmare of an experience, I can truly say it was my focus and calm demeanor that possibly kept me alive that night. I went into fight or flight mode and realized that panicking was going to get me nowhere. I could have been seriously injured or even lost my life. It wasn't too long after this that I ended up quitting that job. To be completely honest with you, no amount of money in the world is worth my life. It wasn't a ghost, wasn't a demon that terrorized me that night at work, but two human beings. People can often sometimes be even scarier and more menacing than the supernatural. If you let them. Around the Bend, from Weston K. I don't believe in living in fear. I think everything happens for a reason, so I say this not in a pessimistic manner. I simply mean, don't take life for granted. The event in question happened a few years ago, while I still lived in western New York State, there were two different ways I could get to work, and I would alternate between them because I get bored of doing the same thing every day. One route in particular would run through a small town where there was nothing but an inn, tavern, ice cream parlor, and embroidery shop. Every time I passed through this village, I slowed down quite a bit in order to safely round a nearly 90 degree turn midway through. I'd always think to myself, it's only a matter of time before someone crashes here. The turn was so sharp that even when I drastically decreased my speed, I still underestimated it 
and had to stop the brake to avoid going off the road. In front of this turn, if you were heading toward my workplace from my apartment, you would see a red building. This building had both the ice cream and embroidery shops together in it. One day I decided I wanted to inquire about how much it would cost to get my music project logo stitched onto a baseball cap. So on my way home, I stopped by and went inside. After talking to the lady at the counter, I decided to come back another time to maybe get something done. A week or so later, I was going around that bend on my way to work. I then noticed a large hole in the side of the building. It was taking up half the length of it. The place also looked like it had been burned. When I got home, I looked into what had happened. Apparently, some guy had been speeding around that sharp turn at night during a rainstorm and drove right off the road. He smashed through the brick wall of the building. This also caused a fire, and the car was quickly engulfed. The fire department was literally across the street from it, but still it took them a moment to respond. I don't know who reported it, but they managed to put out the flames. However, the driver of that car was killed. The article had photos of the accident, the charred SUV sitting in the giant hole in the side of the building. They weren't sure what caused the fire exactly, but I think they speculated about barrels of some kind of chemical igniting in the room the car crashed into. I'm not sure. There were embroidery machines in that room, so maybe they had something to do with it. Luckily, the place was closed at the time, and no one was inside. But the building was declared a total loss and was torn down a few days later, leaving an empty lot behind. Two small businesses, pretty much half of that tiny town, were gone. It occurred to me that I'd been standing right where that car went in a few days earlier. That was the first and last time I would ever be in that building. It was very eerie to think about. Tales from the Break Room is a viewer-submitted podcast featuring allegedly true scary stories that happened on the way to, on the way from, or at work. If you want your story to be narrated on the show, send it to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. As of April 14th, we're paying three cents per word for stories that are approved and make it onto the show. Submission does not guarantee approval or payment. For a limited time only, PayPal only. Tales from the Break Room is an EerieCast Network original podcast hosted by Darkness Prevails. You can follow him on Twitter at Dark Prevails, and you can hear thousands more stories read by him on our other show, Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and rate Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can also enjoy plenty more horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com. Thank you.